In this video, I'm going to walk you through some very important principles of using the 10x probe in a practical situation. And in particular, we're going to look at why you should never use the 1x probe. And if you do, recognize the limitations. And knowing what we know about the structure of the 10x probe, we know that it's really designed specifically for this application of providing a 10x attenuation between the tip and the scope. This is not a general purpose uh, cable that can be used to interconnect any device with the VNC connector on it into a device center test. Never use this with a function generator, for example, as the connection of the function generator to a device center test, because we get that 9 meg resistor in the front end of it. In order to demonstrate an application of using the 10x probe and the power of that flat response giving us a high speed signal, we're going to use a simple Arduino board as the signal source. It's got the, if we look at the digital output signals, it's got a rise time, depending on which generation technology device you have, something over about 5 nanoseconds. Some I've seen are as low as 3 nanoseconds. In order to look at that as a signal source, we're going to use a modified blink sketch in order to turn the uh, digital pin 13 off and on oh, about 500 hertz, just so that we have a nice repetitive signal. And here literally is how we're going to do it. It's really simple. Here is a blank sketch. We're going to grab um, the blink example. So under examples, it's the first one, basic. And under basic, here is blink. And here is the blink sketch. And all we're going to do is make one small modification. Right now, it's set to turn pin 13 off and on with a delay of one second on, one second off. We're just going to make that a millisecond on and a millisecond off. And remember rule number nine, before you do a measurement or simulation, anticipate what you expect to see. So by making this change, when we upload the code, we'll up, start uploading it now. When we upload that code, we're going to see the pin 13 turning off and on uh, every millisecond. So period will be two milliseconds. It'll be about 500 hertz. So now that we've made the change, remember, we go to tools, we select the board. Let's see, what's the board? This board is an AVR and here is AVR board and this is a Uno. Here we go. And the second step is we select the port and this is port 3. Now we're ready to upload. And while we're uploading, let's connect up our probe. So we're going to have a ground connection, and we're going to have the pin 13 connection over here. Now, really important to keep in mind, for this example, this nice big loop that I've created here is not going to cause us a big issue. Uh, we're going to allow this big loop for convenience. In other videos, I'm going to show you the two problems this big loop creates. Problem number one is, the large inductance of this loop will introduce an artifact, and that means that we'll see a little bit of distortion of that signal. And I'll show you later how we get around that problem. And problem number two is, with this big loop, we've made an antenna. It's going to radiate, and if we bring another probe in proximity, it can pick up that near-field radiation, that magnetic field radiation, and we can see crosstalk between the probes that has nothing at all to do with the crosstalk or the behavior of the device under test. But for now, to illustrate the value of 10x versus 1x, we're going to keep that long loop in there just because it's easy to do the measurement. Below that, you know, roughly 1 megahertz bandwidth of signals, it's an, who cares, not important. It's only when we're trying to get that limit to get the couple nanosecond rise time edges where we want to worry about uh, that loop. And we'll see that in some of the other videos. We've got our signal uploaded and I think we've got a signal on the scope. So let's take a look at it. Here's our signal on the scope. Of course, you know, it's moving all around. We can't see it. That's because of the trigger level. And so how do we fix that problem? We adjust the trigger. Now we have a nice beautiful looking signal. There is our square wave. Wow, can't beat that kind of square wave. Okay, and, and we want to look at the rising edge. So we're going to zoom out, look at that rising edge. Uh, let's see, we're about 10 nanoseconds of division. I'm just going to move it over here. Wow, look at that. Here we're at 5 nanoseconds of division. You can see, hey, the rise time is something about the 1090 rise is about 5 nanoseconds. That's a pretty darn good uh, looking signal. This is using the scope setting, and we're in the 10x setting for the probe. Now we're going to switch over and look at the 1x setting. But before we do that, we're going to pay attention to rule number 9. Because remember rule number 9. Rule number 9 says, Hey, before you do a measurement or simulation, you want to think about what you expect to see. 
So let's remember what's going on inside that probe. We got the tip over here, we got the 9 mag resistor, we got the coax cable, we've got the input to the scope, the 1 mag to the scope. We have an input capacitor on the scope, and we've added this shunt 10 puff capacitor to uh, across the 9 mag resistance. So here's the tip, and here's the device under test. Remember, that's the structure of our probe. Now, you would think that when we make the probe a 1x probe, all we're doing is opening up a switch here to shunt the 9 mag resistor and, of course, the 10 puff capacitor. And by shunting out or shorting out the, 10, the 9 mag resistor, of course, what we've done is we've made a direct path over to the 1 mag resistor in the scope. And you think, great, we've just made a 1x probe. And you'd think that would be okay. Yeah, we have the, you know, the capacitance of the cable and we have the, the roughly 20 puff input capacitance of the scope. And you think, in principle, that should be a perfectly fine uh, probe. In fact, it's just like a coax cable, right? In principle. In practice, and the, the difference between in principle and in practice is, in principle, we've got a simplified drawing. In practice, we have what is implemented in the real world. And what's implemented in the real world has the addition of this cable normally would have um, some impedance to it. We connect a fast edge to the front. The signal is going to go down. See the high impedance is going to reflect, bounce back and forth. And we're going to have a ringing artifact, which is exactly what you see in a coax cable. And that ringing can give you artifacts that are in the, in the uh, 20, 30, 40 megahertz kind of frequency range. To avoid that problem, so that when we use the uh, when we have a signal launched into this transmission line, the cable of the 10x probe, to avoid that problem, this cable is not a simple coax cable. It is a very sophisticated piece of interconnect. It has on the inside, first of all, a very tiny diameter signal path that's made of nichrome. And nichrome is an alloy of nic and nickel and chromium, and it has relatively high resistance. And the other thing it has is it has a, a return path and it has a large ratio of the center conductor to the outer shield and it's filled with foam Teflon. That gives it a very high characteristic impedance and the nichrome gives it high series resistance. So really the circuit that we have here when we use 1x configuration isn't really the circuit. In practice it is a direct connection and now we have a series resistance of the center conductor and now it goes into the scope with the 1 meg and the roughly uh, 20 uh, picofarads of input capacitance plus the capacitance of the cable itself. And so what we've built is another low pass filter to get the series resistance of that special coax cable that the scope probe is made from. This series resistance plus the uh, capacitance of the of the cable plus the input capacitance of the scope gives us a low pass filter and we're going to filter some of the signals. So on the 1x scale we're not going to see nice beautiful short rise time signals if that's what we have going in. The, to know what that time constant is we need to know the resistance of the probe. And so we're going to do a simple experiment to actually measure that. Here's our 10x probe and I literally have an ohmmeter we're going to measure the series resistance from the end of the cable and we're going to put it on the 1x setting so there it is on the 1x setting we're going to pop the tip out we're going to connect the center tip to one end of the ohmmeter and the other end of that cable that's going all the way through the 1x probe is connected to the center pin of the probe we're going to connect that in over here. So now we're measuring the series resistance down the center conductor from the tip to the end. And look at what that resistance is. 260 ohms, 258 ohms, about 260 ohms. That is the series resistance of this cable. If you do this measurement with another coax cable, you will find a measurement on the order of one ohm or less. This is extra high resistance, and it's there in order to damp out any of the transmission line reflections in the cable.
Very special, sophisticated cable. But that means we have a 260 ohm series resistor along with the capacitance of the cable and the input capacitance in the scope. Now while we're here, we can do a similar measurement of, suppose we change this from a 1x to a 10x probe. What will we expect to see as the series resistance? Well, when we make it a 10x probe, we're going to put that 9 meg resistor in series. We ought to see 9 meg resistance. Let's check it out. So we switch the switch to 10x. Oh my gosh, darned if it doesn't come out to 9 mega ohm resistance. Exactly what we expect to see. This is the power of rule number 9. The more often we see in our measurement what we expect to see, the higher our confidence level of understanding what is going on in the system. We've now established that we have in the 1x setting a 260 ohm series resistor in the cable. Now let's see what the impact of that is. When we add the 260 ohm resistor, we have a 20 puff here and, and we, have a, we have a 50 to 70 puff capacitance in the cable. That's close to 100 puff. Let's see what our RC time constant is. It's going to be 260 ohms times 100 puff. That's 100 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. And so let's see, what is this? This is going to be 2.6 times 10 to the, I get 10 to the 2 here, I got 10 to the, that's 10 to the 4, and 10 to the minus 12, that's 10 to the minus 8 seconds. That's 26 nanoseconds. We expect to see a step response rise time, something in the order of about 26 nanoseconds when we look at the step response with the 1x probe. Let's take a look at that on our scope. So remember, we've got the Arduino running that modified blink. So we get a nice fast signal coming in. We're going to go back to our scope. We're going to add our little hat to the tip of the probe. We're going to connect in the probe. And we are have the, the scope set on the 10x scale. And when we do that, we see our nice 5 nanosecond rise time signal. So here it is on the 10 nanosecond scale. And you can see, you can eyeball pretty nice 5 nanosecond rise time signal on the 10x probe. Exactly what we saw before. Now, when we switch it to 1x, we expect to see not a 5 nanosecond, but closer to a 30 nanosecond rise time signal. So we switch it over, and we have to do a few other changes here. We change our vertical scale to bring it on scale. There we go, it's on scale. And now I'm going to adjust the trigger level. And oh my gosh, this is every, the time base is the same. You can see the much longer rise time signal. And I bring it in so we have roughly about a division as the rise time. Let's see, it's 50 nanoseconds per division. The R, the 1090 is about 50 nanoseconds. That's 10x higher rise time. And if you look at the 1 over E rise time, you know, it's pretty darn close to our estimate of about 26 nanoseconds. And so we can see that if you use the 1x probe, you artificially, as you add an artifact to the measurement, of a longer rise time. The shortest rise time, 10 nanoseconds rise time, you can see, is something in the order of about 50 nanoseconds. And that's why you want to be really careful using the 1x probe. Remember, it's got that series 260 ohm resistor in the cable itself. If you want the highest bandwidth for the probe, you always want to use the 10x setting. If you use the 1x setting, just remember you have an artifact you have introduced. Yeah, you have a 1x setting, so we're not attenuating the signal. But on the other hand, uh, we also are limiting the rise time that we can see. If you're looking at signals that have a rise time significantly longer than 50 nanoseconds, so a couple hundred nanoseconds, three, four hundred nanoseconds, or slower, longer rise time edges, then a 1x setting would probably be OK. But that means you have to pay extra attention to what's the rise time of my signal compared to that roughly 50 nanoseconds, 1090 intrinsic rise time limit of the 1x probe. And that's why I always recommend never use the 1x setting. There are only very limited cases where a 1x setting is appropriate. 99.9% .9 of the time, you want to use the 10x setting for the probe. That gives us the highest bandwidth and affects the, the signal that we're seeing the smallest amount.